Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together, and I'm going to read our call to worship. We're going to read from Romans 1, verses 14 through 19. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. All right, I'm going to pray for us this morning. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for everybody here in this church. I just pray that as we get ready for worship this morning, that you would open our hearts to receive the word that you have for us. And I pray that you would just put your hand on this church through this time of transition and just uh, help us grow in our faith. We thank you for all that you are, and I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. I see a lot of familiar faces and some not familiar faces. So find one of those people and tell them that you are excited to see them in church this morning.
Let's have a seat for a minute. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Jonathan Brewster. I am the young adult and student pastor here at the church. I'd just like to take a moment to welcome you guys here this morning. Uh, if you're a guest with us here this morning, I'd like to encourage you to fill out one of our connection cards. Uh, there's two ways you can do that. You can scan the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you and fill out an online connection card that way. Or you can go out into our atrium area at our starting point desk and fill out a paper copy there. But that connection card just allows us to get a little bit of information from you and just kind of check back with you after your visit here with us. And so here at the church, we've got a lot going on over the next uh, few weeks. And so I just want to highlight some of that stuff for you here this morning. Uh, first off, we have our CareNet baby bottle campaign that we've had going on um, for the past few weeks. We've got some baby bottles out there in the atrium. And what we've been asking people to do is to take those and fill them up with change or cash or checks or whatever uh, financial gift you would want to put in there. And all that money goes to CareNet, which is a local uh, pregnancy resource center. And so um, they do a lot with, uh, um, you know, just uh, helping men and women with unplanned pregnancies and helping cancel, counsel them through that um, and encouraging them to choose life in that. And so uh, we've got that campaign going on. We're taking up those bottles next Sunday morning is, is the last day to bring those in. Uh, coming up next Saturday on the 18th uh, from 6 to 8 p.m., we're going to have a women's game night. Uh, that's going to be over in the activity center. Uh, they're going to have chili, drinks, desserts, and things like that. They're encouraging that you bring um, a favorite snack and a favorite board game. And those kind of game nights are always a fun time because you get to see different sides of your friends. And you get to make new friends. And so that'll be an awesome time. So we're encouraging all of our ladies to come out to that um, on Saturday night. And then next Sunday, we're going to have a um, special kind of uh, presentation kind of conference type thing Sunday night uh, called how to have the talk with your kids and so we're gonna be talking about some discussions about uh, puberty and hormones and sexuality from a biblical perspective uh, so that'll be at 6 o'clock on the 19th um, that's gonna be a really awesome event I'm really excited that our church is doing that because we are um, you know talking about things from a biblical perspective talking about things that God has created that the world has distorted and so I want to encourage you guys to come to that. There's child care provided for that. We ask that you register online so that we know how many we've got coming to that. And then one more thing that I'd like to highlight um, going on at the end of February is our D-NOW weekend. And so that's an event for 6th um, graders through 12th graders. And it's going to be really awesome. We're going to have that here at the church this year. And so over that weekend, we're going to have 11 different churches from the area bringing students to our church to have a weekend full of worship and Bible study and um, just all kinds of crazy games and fun together. We're going to have over 200 students from northern Kentucky here that weekend. And so I want to encourage you in two ways. One, if you've got a student in your life that's uh, 6th to 12th grade, register them to come to that. Um, it's going to be an awesome time together. And then also, I want to encourage you as a church, be praying for us in that event um, as we plan that, as we get that together, and just pray that lives will be changed of students in northern Kentucky. And so if you have any questions about that event, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, we had a deadline for t-shirts on there, but I bet if you register this week, I can find a couple more. Um, so I want to encourage you guys, send your students to that, be praying for that event. And as always, I want to encourage you guys, check the church website. We've got all kinds of stuff going on all the time in, in all of our different ministries. And so I just encourage you guys to uh, kind of get on there, be in the know of what we've got going on. But as we continue worshiping this morning, I'd like to take a moment to pray for us. God, we thank you uh, just for this, this morning and this opportunity that we have to praise your name, uh, to study your word, and just learn more about who you are. God, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand again as we sing this morning.
Amen. You guys have a seat. Um, we've done this song a couple of times before, and Courtney does an awesome job singing it, but there's a part in this song where it talks about your goodness is running after, running after me. And I think the kids actually also sang this song, but uh, I think it's always a good idea to keep in the back of our minds that as far away as we get, God is still pursuing us, and uh, he wants to be close to us. And most of the time when we're not, it's our fault. So uh, think about that as we sing this one.
Well, good morning, Burlington Baptist Church. And thank the thank the praise team for a good, good job. Amen. Amen. I got to thinking that Sandy was doing that solo. Maybe she used to play in a dark room with a lot of smoke. Yeah. <laughs> she did. She got down on that, didn't she? That was good. That was good. Well, thank you for being here today, and uh, we welcome those of us who are online. I don't know which service is, is broadcast online. Is it this one or the next one? I don't, I don't know, but if you're out there, we welcome you, all right? Uh, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to come back and to be your preacher today. You know, some churches don't invite me back. I don't know why, but, uh, <laughs> but they don't, and, and you did. Our, our, our relationship Joyce and I's relationship with, with you all means a great deal to us, and it's just so warm when we come here, and we thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for inviting me back. I hope you've had a good week. I hope you've had it. I was having a good week till yesterday afternoon, and uh, that was not good. <laughs> you know, I, I take UK's person, I, I take their loss personally, you know. Do you? I, it's an insult to me. I take it personally. I, I know a man of God shouldn't do that, but, uh, but I do. <laughs> and if you haven't had a good week, I hope when you come in here that what was done here with the music and the prayers and the word and the preaching and, and most of all, the warm fellowship of being with the, this congregation. We are here to encourage one another. We're here to do all this, but we're here to encourage one another. So speak encouraging words today to those that are around you. Today I want to talk to you about the best news ever. So much bad news. Let's talk about the best news ever. Pray with me and we'll get to it. Father, as we journey towards the promised land, Refresh, renew, and restore us in our journey. Father, we pray for those who come here today just drained of energy and zest for life. We pray for those who are going through a period of testing and dryness in their faith and in their relationships. Revive them, Father. And Father, today we pray for the people of Turkey and Syria. Today so many in those lands are afraid. They wait in fear of the next tremor. They hear the cries of the injured among the rebel. And you can just see those poor people roaming the streets in shock at what they are seeing. And they just fill the air with their cries of grief for the missing and for the dead. And Father, comfort them in this disaster. Be their rock when the earth refuses to stand still and shelter them under your wings for those whose homes no longer exist. And Father, just embrace all of those in your arms who have died so suddenly, and I just pray that you will Console the hearts of those who mourn for them and ease the pain of those who are on the brink of death. Now, Father, pour through me the gift of preaching. Take these human words and use them to speak to us today. Give each of us here just the message you want us to hear. We pray to you in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. We see it all the time. You remember this guy? Remember this guy? Remember that? We see John 3, 16 all, all the time. And uh, remember that guy that had the multicolored wigs that would be at the ball games with John 3, 16? I wonder whatever happened to him. But John 3, 16 is one of the most recognizable symbols of our faith. And, and it's so familiar to us, but how many of us really know it? John 3.16 is more displayed than it is experienced. 
So today, what I want to do is to invite you to enter in to the best news ever and experience John 3, 16. Dr. Mary Harris was for many years the New Testament professor at Trinity Divinity School, and he said that John 3, 16 is the most famous sentence in all of literature, and I think I would agree with that. So look at the screen. Read it out loud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The great theologian Dr. Frederick Bruner took 10 years to write his commentary on the Gospel of John. This is what Dr. Bruner says about John 3.16. God, the greatest subject ever, so the greatest extent ever, loved the greatest affection ever, the world the greatest object ever, he gave his only son the greatest gift ever, whoever believes the greatest opportunity ever, shall not perish the greatest rescue ever, have everlasting life the greatest promise ever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Max Lucado in his book 316 says it like this. He loved, he came, we believe, we live. Now I can't improve on that, so let's, let's, let's go with it. He loved, for God so loved. Now at the heart of every truth we believe is the reality <clears throat> that God is love. And, and folks, I don't know about you, but that is the source of my comfort in these uncommon times. We've never seen times like this. And one of the sources of comfort that I get is knowing that God is on his throne and God is love. And the coming of Jesus Christ proved beyond a shadow of a doubt what God is like. God is love. Now, I, I think this statement, God is love, requires us to rethink who God is. Folks, God is not some judge just waiting to pronounce sentence upon us. He's not this cosmic auditor that's checking a list and making a list and checking it twice and going to find out who's naughty and nice. God is not this cosmic power that just beats us into surrender. No, no. God so loved. Now, there's something in us that responds to that reality. And that's why we still like to sing, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's one of the greatest songs ever written. See, the coming of Jesus proved beyond a shadow of a doubt what God is like God so loved. And the other day, I found myself singing that little song. We used to sing it in vacation Bible school. He's got the whole world in his hands. Remember, remember that? He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got the itty-bitty baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. And the truth that we are being held and loved by God does not create fear, but it creates comfort. When we are held by God, it's loving hands that hold us. One line in the song that we just sang is, all my days I am held in your hands. Now, I love listening to the National Christian Choir. They're from Washington, D.C., got a lot of their CDs. They have wonderful stuff. And there's a song that they sing that I play every now and then because it has been such a comfort uh, to me. And it goes like this. Jesus, hold me, hold me. I'm in the midst of a storm. Jesus, hold me, hold me. I'll be safe. In my Father's arms. Amen? God so loved. St. Augustine said God loves each one as, up, 
as if there was only one to love. The best news ever. He loved. He came. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, he came. Why? Why? What are the implications of the great fact that he came? The assurance of God's love, folks, calls for a relationship between us and God. A relationship to him through Jesus Christ is what he came is all about. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loved and he came and that calls for a relationship with him. One of my favorite true stories, you know, some stories that we preachers tell, you think, Are that, is that true or not? This is a true story. It's one of my favorites. She was 15, and he was 17 when they met. All through high school, they went steady. And it was no surprise that after graduation, they got married. Four years later, two children later, she was standing in the kitchen. The sink was piled with dirty dishes. There was dirty laundry all over the house. Tears are streaming down her cheek and two crying babies. And looking back, she never really could be exactly sure when she made the decision, but she made it. She took off her apron and she walked out. That night, her young husband jumped for the phone when it rang. He was worried out of his mind, extremely angry, and he said, where are you? trying to control his temper. How are the children, she asked, ignoring his question. Well, if you mean if they're all right and well-fed and they're in the bed, yes, they're okay. But they're wondering, just as I am wondering, what on earth are you doing? She hung up the phone that night, but it was not the last of her calls. She called almost every week for the next three months. And that young husband knows something is seriously wrong. And when she called, he began to, to complete, to plead with her, come home, come home. And he would tell her, I love you, I love you, I love you. The kids love you. We miss you. The kids are okay. They're with their grandparents during the day. I pick them up, bring them home, feed them supper, give them baths, get them in the bed. The kids are okay. They're well cared for. But we miss you. We love you. We love you. And then he would try to find out where she was. And when that call went to where her whereabouts was, she would hang up. Finally, he could stand it no longer. He took all their savings and he hired a private detective to find his wife. The detective reported back that she was in a third-rate hotel in Des Moines, Iowa. That young husband borrowed money from his in-laws, bought a plane ticket to Des Moines, took a cab from the airport to the hotel that she was in and climbed the steps to the third floor room. Those kind of hotels <laughs> didn't have elevators. Now, if you'd have been there, you would have seen the fear and the doubt in his eyes. You would have seen the sweat on his forehead. You would have seen his hands tremble as he knocked on the door. And when she opened the door, he forgot his prepared speech and he just said, I love you, I love you, I love you. We love you so much. Won't you please come home? She fell apart in his arms. They went home together. One evening, some weeks later, the children were in the bed, and they were sitting in front of the fireplace, and Johnny finally got up the nerve to ask, whenever I called, are you called? And, and why wouldn't you come home? When I told you over and over and over that I loved you and missed you, why didn't you come home? And she said with profound simplicity, because before those were only words, Johnny, but you came, Johnny, you came, you came. That's it. That is it. He loved and he came. Now, John 3.16 is some of the most profound words in all of Scripture. 
And it's nice to know that God loves us, but he didn't just say it in words and cliches. He came. He came to us in his son, Jesus. Just like Johnny. He loved and he came. And just like Johnny, he came to take us home. Best news ever. He loved, he came, and we believe. We believe. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, whoever, we believe, we believe. Now, you will be surprised because that verse does not say you must believe. It does not say it's imperative that you believe. It says whoever, whoever believes. See, folks, God loves us too much to force us to believe in him. Remember the rich young ruler? Remember You, you remember him. He comes to Jesus all stressed out, and he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at that young man, and he loved him. And Jesus said, son, your life is absolutely cluttered. And you've got too much stuff. Just give away your stuff to the poor and come follow me. And the young man was so sad, so very sad. I can't. I, I, I can't. I, I just have to have my stuff. Folks, Jesus gave him room to say no. Because if you don't have room to say no, then yes does not mean a thing, does it? If God didn't give us room to say no, then when we said yes to him, it wouldn't mean anything. It's whoever loves. Now, there have been many times and many places where people have been emotionally coerced or socially coerced or even militantly coerced to follow Jesus. There was a Jewish couple that lived in a German community. It was a community. They were Jewish. It was a community of Protestant Christians. All of them were Protestant Christians. And this Jewish couple could not find work no matter how hard they tried. We're qualified. We are clerks. We can work in the courts. We can work in a business. We, we've got our, creden our credentials. Why couldn't they find work? They were not in the church. You want to find work? You join the church. Well, they joined the church just to get work and to keep their family from starving. Matter of fact, they were even baptized into that. In, in, they were baptized. That Jewish couple had a son named Carl. Carl Marx, who was so incensed that what that church did to his parents just so they could find work he became an enraged enemy of all that we believe and all that we love. All because somebody misunderstood whoever believes. Whoever believes. See, folks, love that is forced is it's manipulation. You, you can force your family. You may be stronger, bigger than your family. You can, you can force them to, to love you with acts because you're bigger and stronger, but in order for love to be love, it must have a choice. So God came. He came to us in Jesus, and he said, now you have a choice. The ball is in your court. I love you. I have demonstrated my love for you, but you must come yourself. No matter, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you come just as you are, but you must believe. If you're thirsty, I will give you living water because I love you, but you must drink. If you're hungry, I will give you the bread of life because I love you, but you must eat. If these uncommon days are making you tired and weary and all stressed out, I will give you rest 
because I love you, but you must lean on me. If you sin, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you because I love you, but you must believe. See, folks, Jesus' love calls for a commitment. Whoever believes. See, there are choices. There are choices to be made here. We have to choose. Now, why is believing so important? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Let me go back to Dr. Harris again and quote what he says. He says, to believe in Jesus is to have faith that is directed towards him, faith that is focused on him. It involves the total commitment of oneself to the person of Christ as Messiah and Lord forever. Hmm. I like the way John Stott puts it. He says, the value of faith is not to be found in itself, but entirely and exclusively in its object, namely Jesus Christ and him crucified. Faith is the eye that looks to him. Faith is the hand that receives his free gift. And faith is the mouth that drinks in the living water. Best news ever. Best news ever. So what's your response to the best news ever? Do you believe it or not? It's available. If you've never believed it, it's available. And he offers his love to anyone who ever believes. Now, maybe you come here this morning and you sort of lost your way and you're trying to get back. All of us lose our way at one time or another, don't we? And that's why Jesus came. And he loves us. Here's the good thing. Here he loves us enough to just keep coming, to, come, coming to us, coming to us. And if you are here and you are seeking him, don't give up. Don't give up. Because he is seeking you this morning. Best news ever. He loved. He came. We believe. We live. <laughs> we live. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Mm. See, when we respond to that love and we believe in Jesus, we begin our journey toward heaven, our journey home. And Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Wow. Now, we're, we're going to be celebrating Holy Week and Easter and, and Calvary and the resurrection in a few weeks. And that's what made it possible for us to live forever. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We live. We live. And we're going to live forever. Years ago, our church was over on 42 before we came to Burlington. And I don't know how it got started. But we sang a little chorus every Sunday, every Sunday. And uh, it, it, it was, I think it come from, from the Gaithers. I, I, I think it did. And it goes, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to die. No, never. Jesus died on the tree for me. And I'm going to live forever. Eat your heart out, Bill Gaither. See, the promise of John 3.16 is this. There will be a time, there will be a day when all of this mess will end forever and we will be in a place where God will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore for the former things. Watch the word will have what? Passed away. I lay in bed sometimes thinking about that. What's it going to be like? I have a hard time putting my mind around that. What's it like? And I say to Joyce, what will it be like to never have a stressful thought? What would it be like not to ever worry about your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. What will that be like? I just, I just, it's hard to put our minds around, but it's coming. 
It's coming. And it's not pie in the sky by and by. For those of us who put our faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, it begins right now. And then one day Jesus is going to come and call a halt to all this mess, and we're going to be with him forever, forever. And our life will be as God intended it to be. We will live, and it's hard to imagine, as I said, we will look back on this brief moment from a perfect world and we will have perfect bodies and perfect souls and be in perfect relationship with God and be in perfect relationship with one another. I heard a guy, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this. I heard a guy say the other day, talking about heaven, he said, in heaven I'll be able to even get along with my ex. <laughs> And that's a good thought. <laughs> and our life will be as God intended it. These are scary times, folks. These are scary times, isn't it? And sometimes you almost panic looking at the bad news. But whenever you're experiencing all that bad news, keep your eyes focused on the best news ever. He loved. He came, we believed, and we live. Read it out loud with me one more time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen and amen. Pray with me. Father, we worship you because... You are a most merciful, compassionate God. The giver of life, the giver of love, the giver of hope, the giver of salvation. But Father, at times we are just overwhelmed by the enormity of all the bad news. And sometimes our hearts are absolutely hushed and our minds are just numb, numb by all the bad news. God, let us not forget and lift our voice and proclaim the best news ever. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Today, if you've never believed in Jesus for your salvation, that's what we're here to do, offer you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And if you want to do that, if you'll come to one of us down front, we'll be able to help you do that. Maybe you need, need to get off the bubble and become a member of our Burlington Baptist Church. If you've never obeyed him in baptism, we give you that invitation as well. Let's stand and let's sing.
you guys be seated a minute, Jeff's going to come up and talk to us. For Good morning, Burlington Baptist. I get to say, I get to say it, even though I'm not on announcements today. That makes me good. Um, I just wanted to come and share with you some exciting news. Uh, this week, it was presented to us that the nominating committee, who has been diligently working and praying and seeking the people that would serve on our search committee, now have that work done. So next Sunday, following um, our worship services at 5 o'clock in this room, we will be having a special call business meeting for the purpose of seating those people as our search committee for our next pastor. Um, a couple of things that I just wanted to touch on very quickly and not dwell on was I know the process seems like it's strained. I know the process seems like it's secret, but it's really not. It's one of those things that has been prayed about, and we just want to respect those people as they were presenting themselves as possible candidates so they can work that out with God and, and the dedication it's going to take to serve in that position. So as we move forward, the one thing I uh, just ex expect and I ask of you is that you continually be in prayer for them. Um, as I said, when Harold had resigned and Harold was still sitting there, God already knows who our next pastor is. It's only us in here that sit and wonder and have the questions, so I don't have any problem in following God's leading. And I better not, and you better not either, because that's exactly the reason why we trust and put our full faith in him. So next Sunday night, you want to come, hear about the candidates, meet the candidates, questions. That's what that time of business is for. And again, that will be at 5 o'clock next Sunday. Same old, same old. Dollar Club boxes are in the back. I'm going to steal that from Dandy today. And just so great to see everybody here. It's a beautiful day outside. And I know that we're leaning on that spring thought just a little bit more today. But as we get ready to go into our Bible study times, just uh, join me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and serve you through this church. And Father, we know the church is made up of the body. And that as our body begins the search for another pastor, Father, we lean on you in prayer and just trust. And we know that you're going to work things as you see fit. And Father, for those people that are being considered, the ones that have been praying about it, the ones you've been having these conversations with, I ask you that you bless them and give them the right set of uh, thoughts, but most of all, the ability just to lean on you and all the leaning and let the Holy Spirit move in the way that he sees fit, fit and needs to move. And Father, as a church body today, as we gather in this place, it's just been a moment just to have the, the word broken for us by LD, and we just thank you so much, and we pray that we're leaving this place differently so we can go out and serve you this week in a mighty way. Father, all this is possible because of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his saving grace and his mercy. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen.